Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. It's Friday, the 11th of June, 2021, and as you can see there, we've got something to talk about, maybe something brewing in the southern Gulf of Mexico, Bay of Campeche area. It's funny, I mentioned the possibility of the National Hurricane Center beginning to issue a tropical weather outlook for this area on my morning podcast, Hurricane Season, the podcast. It's an audio podcast that I do every morning, and I figured it would be a couple of days until we would see it, but nevertheless, here it is today. They have already mentioned it, and you can see this reflected from the National Weather Service Houston tweet uh, a little while ago uh, that the NHC continues to monitor the potential for tropical development now down in the Bay of Campeche, 20% chance over the next five days. Of course, this is going to be a slow process. We've talked about that for a while now that this whole area being unsettled, it's going to be a slow process, part of this Central American gyre that has set up shop down here. It's not as pronounced as we've seen them in the past, but nevertheless it's there. There's some energy down here in the southeastern Pacific, and then we've got this area outlined for the Bay of Campeche Southern Gulf as well. So here's the southeast Pacific shot. There's one system way, way out south and west of the mainland part of Mexico with about a 50% chance of development overall. And then closer up here to this Gulf of Tehuantepec region, which is right there, we do have this other system with about a 50% chance of development. And I think what's going to happen is this large piece of energy sitting in here, this gyre, is just going to kind of rotate around the different areas of vorticity or energy. Another way to look at that is a seedling. Uh, either out of the Southeast Pacific or something develops uh, on its own over here on the east side of this gyre into the Bay of Campeche where it'll kind of take root, if you will, develop and eventually come north and end up somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. Not really sure, and that part doesn't matter just yet because we don't have enough details on it, so I really can't pinpoint you know, impacts, who may receive what, how strong it might get. You know, it's June, water temperatures are warm enough, and it's just a matter now of when and if we get development, how consolidated it can become, and what is the overall environment going to be like. All right, so looking at the satellite animation this afternoon of what we have going on out there, not a whole lot. We can still see the strong upper-level winds cutting across. This looks like it's kind of been stuck here, doesn't it? Cutting across the eastern Caribbean some convective activity, again, across parts of the Northeast Caribbean, maybe even a few pop-up showers down in the islands from there as well. I got a, a text earlier today from Carlos, one of our supporters down in San Juan area, uh, showing me all the rain that they were getting. Very heavy rain, knocked the power out for about nine hours, he said, down there yesterday. And even Brent in the Virgin Islands in St. John, uh, indicating that, yep, it's still pretty rainy down there, kind of squally conditions and you can see a few pop-up thunderstorms you know it's interesting about that it shows me that there's instability it's not just dry down there we're getting these pop-up air mass thunderstorms so you have an unstable atmosphere and it just takes a little bit of heating some kind of trigger mechanism and there you go we're getting these showers and heavier uh, thunderstorms from time to time down in the caribbean and so once we get into a more favorable pattern with tropical waves coming along, especially once we get to August, you know, this signature here of a, a more unstable atmosphere may be pointing the way to what we see down the road a piece. Now, in the Pacific, you can see how things have become a little bit more active through here, more convection. That is the telltale sign of this more favorable upward motion pattern that's setting up shop, this Madden-Julian oscillation. Anytime you see these clusters of thunderstorms and just the overall convective pattern, it tells you that, hey, look, there's upward motion and this general sort of window here will just shift gradually from west to east, moving across the Atlantic, you know, after passing the Caribbean, of course, and eventually we might see some signs of development try to take shape out in the tropical Atlantic uh, over the next 10 days or so, maybe some more robust tropical waves that at least give it a shot and maybe raise an eyebrow or two, because this is a pretty solid pulse coming in uh, for this time of year. There's still, you know, we're not quite to mid-June yet. All right, so looking at the vorticity signature, so far nothing showing up in the Bay of Campeche or Southern Gulf, but there's this piece of energy here, 
And this is what's going to be so fascinating and easy, quite frankly, to track, is let's see if we get any of this energy to kind of pivot around into the Bay of Campeche or the Southern Gulf. Does new energy simply develop there? Sometimes the energy would just kind of sit down here. Maybe it comes ashore near the Gulf of Tawanapak there. And then it just kind of jumps over this little land bridge here, if you will, this isthmus. It's a geographic term, isthmus. Uh, and maybe reform in the Bay of Campeche. There's a lot of different ways that this stuff can happen. At 850 millibars, a piece of that energy can migrate north. The bottom line, though, this will be the region right down here to watch through the weekend into early next week to see if something develops and moves up towards the United States. But in the meantime, this feature that you see in the eastern Pacific will bring heavy rainfall for our friends down in southeast Mexico. So we don't want to discount that. It's not like nobody lives there, right? So it's not very strong, not forecast to be very strong by the models here, what would impact Mexico, but some heavy rain nevertheless. So water temperatures in the Gulf, if we do get something to develop, and it's leaning towards that happening now more and more, the water temperatures are not really going to be a, a limiting factor. They are warm enough down there. You can see 29 Celsius in the southern part of the Gulf right through here. I'll outline it for you. And then the rest of this is about 28 Celsius. That's about 82 Fahrenheit. And then you get a little bit cooler from there, 27 uh, out in the open northern Gulf there. But then right along the shelf up here, the shelf waters, those are shallower, easier to warm up. And so those water temperatures are also about 28 Celsius or so 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So water temperatures are warm enough. That's not going to be an, an inhibitor. It'll be the upper level winds. Does this get to consolidate? Does the energy bundle up? Do the upper level winds kind of tear things apart? And those are the details that we just can't pinpoint yet. By the way, look at this. If you look closely, you can see the loop current right there. Isn't that neat? I think it's pretty neat. That's a nice little ribbon of moving water that's a current so the water is in motion flows up out of the Caribbean Sea comes through the Gulf here it's a little bit warmer but the bottom line is it's constantly moving and so the ocean heat content through here is getting refreshed every second and so when you have hurricanes that kind of traverse this one way or the other maybe coming this way or something coming up this way I'm just pointing it out that loop current as we saw in 2005 can play a big role. So we'll keep an eye on that when the time comes. I just noticed it there in the graphic. The subtleties of these high resolution graphics are pretty cool sometimes. All right, so looking at the GFS, this is this morning's run. Initialized 12Z today. You notice not much down in the Bay of Campeche. There's the system near the Gulf of Tawanapek over there. Let's use a different color to highlight the highlighter. There we go. Bay of Campeche, Gulf of Tawanapek region. Not much to speak of now, at least in the Gulf of, uh, or the Bay of Campeche, but as we move this out into time, every six hours or so, you see what happens. The system down in the Gulf of Tawanapek kind of hangs out, but then this overall circulation, you can see it. Follow the wind barbs there, kind of comes around like this. And so any piece of energy can pivot around and just kind of get stuck there, taking advantage of that warm water, and that's how we might get the genesis of this to develop. So here's 48 hours, there's 72, and it's interesting because at this point, the energy, energy does just kind of migrate across, ends up in the southwest Bay of Campeche, so some heavy rain, flood threat potentially for uh, Mexico there on the Gulf side, the Bay side, the Bay of Campeche, uh, but there's a lot of energy, just a nice solid southeast flow coming in of deep tropical moisture. No shortage of that owed to the Bermuda High sitting out here. And it's sending just deep, deep moisture towards this area. So it's not like there's going to be a lot of dry air around. I mean, you know, some in the mid-levels, but the low levels are definitely going to be seeded uh, with lots of moisture and humidity there to fuel this. So at 96 hours, it starts to gradually take shape there. And by 120, you can see the makings, the way that the height lines get bent in here. This trough develops, this little trough, surface trough in here, tries to close off and get going. So I think at about day five, you know, we'll see this really start to gel. Lots of deep thunderstorms down there. Then by day six, 
different pieces come out. And this is where it's going to be so critical. You know, is the model just not understanding all this heat down there? You see these different blobs there. Let me point those out right there. Uh, a couple of them. There's another one down here. These little vort maxes, a maximum of vorticity where it's trying to bundle up, but you know it hasn't quite done so. And if you got a bunch of them sitting around there and they compete with each other, it's going to be one large mess instead of a consolidated, more impressive low pressure area, i.e., stronger. So the longer that it takes and the more disheveled it is, the more of a rainmaker it is versus wind lower air pressure and storm surge but you can have a 50 60 mile tro uh, per hour tropical storm that brings storm surge issues to the gulf coast up here we saw that last year with cristobal so don't forget and by the way by day five and six look down here a little piece of energy you can just see it reflected right there going through the windwards uh, and leewards maybe bringing uh, some wind shifts Showers and thunderstorms, a little tropical wave action, you know, starting to fire up there. So this is day six. We'll go out to day seven, and that's it. So 168 hours out, uh, large, messy system, lots of areas of vorticity, you know, heading up towards the central Gulf Coast. So look at this and say to yourselves, you know, okay. Whoops, I didn't mean to go full screen. There we go. That was too big of a mark. Look at this and say, okay, hey, look, it's hurricane season. We remember Cristobal last year. That was a 50, 60 mile per hour tropical storm, something like that. That brought you know some decent impacts because it had a big wind field. Don't get all upset. Don't worry about it. Um, don't you know think, oh, this is going to evolve into a, a big hurricane or something. Just think it's hurricane season. Duh, stuff could develop, and I better be ready for it, whatever that means for your location. You might have a shrimp boat. You may have beach activities planned. You may have offshore oil interest and you know gusty winds things like that can cause problems there are a variety of outcomes and a lot of people down there with a lot of different preparedness situations and reasons why they watch this stuff and this far out we're talking a week you know the details just cannot be resolved uh, just yet but the consensus seems to be growing that's the GFS here's the euro again going out to the same time period four days five days six days seven days it too by the way the euro showing a large kind of messy system here not really consolidated a little bit more to the west owed to a stronger ridge sitting out here blocking this from getting as far east as the gfs has if we can compare the two at the same time frame the gfs more east and north the euro south and west but the bottom line you know, clearly you can see both of these global models, these are, the, these are the deterministic models, what we call the operational, indicating development in the western gulf, southwest gulf, somewhere in that vicinity over the next week. So pay attention, be ready for it, and we will deal with the impacts and what we can expect as we go forward. Speaking of going forward, we talked about this a little bit the other day uh, in a couple of tweets that and posts from Storm2K, I do believe, about the Euro seasonal. Here's another graphic and representation of it from our buddy Ben Knoll, kind of summarizing things up, the keys here to the rest of the season. The ACE uh, for the Atlantic, according to the Euro, 130% of normal. Higher chance for La Nina coming in. And this is interesting, below average West Pacific typhoon activity. That's a pretty big red flag right there for the Atlantic in terms of, you know, when the Pacific, especially the West Pac, is below average the Atlantic usually takes over so that's a very interesting look these are the different uh, precipitation anomalies that you see not a lot can get derived from this overall I mean you can compare what we had last year and eh, somewhat it was helpful but the bottom line I think is this right here and this uh, La Nina look overall to the Euros ensembles it has a few members that stay warmer but a lot more members now going towards cold, cold ENSO or El Nino Southern Oscillation. And you can see that represented over here. This is the expanded graphic. Look at this. This is the subsurface. We warmed things up, but look what's happening right here. We get this break, this upwelling Kelvin wave coming in from all that warmth. That's, a, that's all subsurface uh, through April into May. We got all that warming going on, and then it's just starting to go away all of a sudden. 
So the shift back towards La Nina that the model is predicting, this is a prediction right here, get that arrow out of there, this is the reality over here, you know, that it breaks away, breaks up, yeah, it's interesting because this is not a forecast, this is exactly what's going on. You can see the time ticking by there as we get through the most recent frame, the 7th of June, you bet, you know, something to keep an eye on because if we drop the sea surface temperatures across the equatorial Pacific back towards La Nina and the Atlantic is just average, you know, it doesn't even have to be that much above average, uh, we could have a very busy season ahead of us. So that's something to watch, a very interesting development there, especially now that we're in, in June. We're not talking about this in March, even though we were. All this guidance has been basically the same since March, that it's going to be a busy season, so forth and so on, and it's holding that tune, if you will, now that we are into June. So we'll watch that golf development potential. I'll talk about it each morning on Hurricane Season, the podcast. It's just an audio podcast available through Spotify, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google, that kind of thing. You can even ask your Amazon Alexa to play it. And if you've got a Spotify account, I believe it pulls it out of there. Hurricane Season, the podcast, each and every morning, a quick three, four, five-minute digest of what I'm looking at across the tropics, and then we go into detail with it on the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion right here on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube... Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I think you can learn a lot and hang out with us when we have live coverage. A lot of people do hurricane updates and that kind of stuff. Not very many people do the live coverage like we do, and we've been doing it for a very long time. So it's good to have you. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Subscribe, like, share, all that good stuff, and it's great to have you around. Have a great rest of your Friday, a good weekend ahead. I'll be back tomorrow and Sunday with more updates. And we'll see how things shake out. I'm Mark Sutteth, HurricaneTrack.com. We'll chat again tomorrow.